The Renaissance was a fervent period of cultural, artistic, political, and economic rebirth, beginning in Italy and making its way across Europe. While men were studying up to be knowledgeable in politics, war, and high art, women on the other hand focused on one thing, beauty. From bleach blunders to blood-sucking beauty tricks, we're tackling the strenuous efforts made by Renaissance women to keep up with the times. But before we get into the pretty gritty, welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we'll be talking about beauty practices during the Renaissance. Let's get started. Looks were a top priority in Renaissance Italy as they could be perceived as an outward reflection of a person's character. Though inner beauty wasn't the only key to outer beauty. These women went to drastic measures to keep up with the pressures to be beautiful. This was of high importance for women as beauty was one of the few things that could enhance their status in society. So you're a young Renaissance woman looking for the full works. Where do we start? Skin, of course. Pale skin was still in, representing wealth, youthfulness, and health. For those not blessed with naturally pale skin, rather dangerous compounds such as lead oxide, hydroxide, carbonate, mercury, and vermilion would be applied to the face to achieve the coveted pale complexion. In particular, mercury granted the illusionary effect of innocence, fertility, and virtue, blurring the aging process and airbrushing blemishes, freckles, and brown spots. I think we know that Instagram filter. However, these highly in-demand, skin-enhancing cosmetic applications would have devastating fatal effects on health, at times leading to scarring, wrinkled, leathery skin, facial muscle paralysis, headaches, and ultimately early deaths. If you were looking for a more natural approach that would help enhance this translucent effect, you could wash in your own urine or with a mixture of rosemary and wine. Special occasion coming up? No problem. Just apply leeches to your face and ears. The leeches would drain the blood from the head, thus leaving the women their much desired, never worked a day in their life look. However stomach-churning it may sound, leeches were in fact a far healthier alternative to some of the more harmful ways of attaining a pale complexion. While the measures taken for fair skin were cause for concern, the application of other makeup was low-key in comparison. Affluent women would use antimony or soot to darken their short but dense eyelashes. Additionally, they would sometimes line their eyelids in black liquid and shadowed their lids with brown, gray, blue-green, or violet colors. Eyebrows needed to remain light and airy, so they were often tweezed or even cut to ensure they were not overly prominent. Wealthier women would often use pricey saffron to highlight their cheekbones, while less affluent ladies wore a tawdry earth red. As for the lips, Renaissance ladies commonly used honey and vermilion, which could either be left natural or tinted to a full, highly defined and luscious red color. Many Renaissance women followed their beauty regimens religiously. Catherine de Medici used pigeon dung on her face to achieve a young, dewy complexion, while Mary, Queen of Scots, was said to have bathed in wine to keep her youthful appearance. And Diane de Poitiers' foundation of youth? Drinking gold, of course. A 24-carat transformation in 24 hours, we imagine. Say cheese! Teeth whitening methods were common in the Renaissance. One such recipe advised mixing pumice stone, brick, and coal, followed by a rubbing of the teeth vigorously. Another teeth whitening ritual was to use dragon blood mixed with red coal powder and white wine tartare. Contrastingly, during the reign of Elizabeth in England, it became fashionable to paint the teeth black. Not only had the appearance of tooth decay highlighted the fact that one could afford sweets, but it was also an effective cover-up for enamel that had been worn off of teeth from some of the more destructive whitening rituals. A win-win. Skin burns and eye infections were not the only risks women faced while trying to live up to their society's beauty standards. Moral criticism could befall them as well. Augmenting your physical appearance by wearing makeup could endanger the state of the immortal soul. First of all, it was a sin because by changing your appearance, you're altering the work of God. Secondly, a woman whose beauty had been enhanced with cosmetics could seduce men into committing sexual misbehavior. In this, makeup was deemed just as dangerous as dresses with plunging necklines. Those poor men. 
Do blondes have more fun? The perfect Renaissance woman seemed to think so. The ideal was to have long, wavy golden hair on a high, white forehead. This forced women with darker locks to come up with ideas to lighten their hair. Saffron and onion skin dyes were commonly used for this purpose, as well as elements like alum, sulfur, and soda. However, most of these products didn't work on their own. They required long hours in the hot sun, which activated the bleach. Remember, these ladies didn't want to be in the sun to risk a tan or worse, a burn. So to bleach their hair and stay pale, they had to sit outside for hours in heavy clothing and hats to protect their skin and faces. Unfortunately, these bleaching processes were by no means perfect and led to some rather unusual shades of hair color, ranging anywhere from platinum blonde to a carrot top red. Additionally, the bleaching process often severely damages the hair, leaving it dry, brittle, and prone to easy breakage. In terms of styling hair, the savvy Renaissance beauty was quite particular. The upper-class sophisticates sought a high hairline, since a wide and high forehead was an essential trait of beauty during this era. Many women who weren't graced with a naturally high forehead plucked their hairlines to get the desired effect. Other women opted to hide their hairlines under jeweled turbans or caps, which were also popular at the time. Under their head covering, most Renaissance women pulled their hair back tight against the skin and braided it, often and in very elaborate designs. Certainly not all Renaissance women's attention went to the hair on her head. It was also fashionable at the time to have flawlessly hairless skin, and removing unwanted hair was no easy feat for someone with a weak stomach. One hair removal recipe reads that you take equal parts of the blood of tortoises, frogs, and owls, together with ant eggs, red orpiment, goma de halera, and mix it with vinegar. Apply it discreetly so that you don't flay yourself. As disturbing as the warning at the end of this hair removal recipe shows, some of these mixtures could be quite dangerous. We're sure the burn ointment was never out of reach. Cancel your gym membership, ladies, because in Renaissance Italy, you won't need them. This was a period that admired fleshy arms and legs, broad hips, and a round stomach. Physicians even suggested foods to eat to fatten yourself up. Carbs aside, as much as it was encouraged to be a curvier woman during the Renaissance, you just had to make sure it didn't affect your bosom. That's right, small breasts were the vogue during the Renaissance. The preference for small breasts in Renaissance Italy not only had to do with the young age of marriable women, but also with their sexual identity. Therefore, people equated that of large breasts with a sign of sexual experience, whereas small breasts were a sign of modesty or virginity. So those unmarried women with larger breasts through no fault of their own often scrambled to try outrageous methods to suppress or reduce growth. Now, perhaps you're thinking, why didn't these women just rebel and leave their bodies as they were? Not unlike today, the pressures of perfection were high, and large breasts could ruin your reputation as immodest or indecent. Women would even wear a predecessor of the modern bra to flatten their chests. While no woman should ever be ashamed for what she was born with, Times were tough, and sometimes fitting in was a safer bet than standing out. Meanwhile, one woman scandalized the 15th century French court by being the original poster child for hashtag free her nipple. Agnes Sorel, official mistress of Charles VII, was known for her ample bosom and took an if you've got it flaunted approach to her assets. Not only did she accentuate her collotage with an uncut diamond necklace, Agnes also made a habit of keeping her bodice unlaced so that her breasts were exposed. While this shocked many, it was still an inspiration to other women in the court and even caught the eye of painter Jean Fouquet. He was so inspired by Agnes's grand Tetons that he used her as a model for his painting, the virgin and child surrounded by angels, merging her spectacular beauty and confidence with the sacrility of the Madonna. On a scale of one to leeches, how far would you go to risk your life for Renaissance beauty? Let us know in the comments. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Nutty History. Don't forget to like and subscribe.